Greetings and Ave Maria. Today we're going to be looking at St. Michael the Archangel, our great defender against Satan and all the demons. Today we're going to look at the liturgical calendar, the place of not only Michael on the liturgical calendar, but also Raphael and St. Gabriel. And we'll also look at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. We'll look at how many times St. Michael was traditionally mentioned in the Latin Mass and how that was done away with uh, over the period from 1960 to 1970. Regrettably, we'll talk about the Leonine prayers, the St. Michael prayer, uh, the tradition of Leo the Thirteenth. Uh, a lot of things. We're going to go over all that. But before we do, we will pray. Uh, I think we'll go ahead and do our Latin prayer. We'll start with the Our Father, the Pater Noster in Latin, and then uh, I'll pray the St. Michael prayer, and I'll do that in Latin as well. Unfortunately, I don't have it printed. I just have the Our Father for you today, so you can just listen along or pray it with me uh, with the St. Michael prayer in Latin. Let's begin. In nomine Patris et Fidei et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater Noster, qui est in celis, sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniant regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cello et in terra, panum nostrum quotidianum de nobis odie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos amalo. Amen. And then the St. Michael prayer. Sancta Mica Archangelae, defende nos in prelio, contra nequitiam in insidia diaboli esto presidium, Imperit ili Deus, suplice deprecamor, tuque princeps militiae celestis, satanam aliosque spiritus malignos, qui ad perditionem animorum pervagantur in mundo, divina virtute in infernum derude. Amen. In nomine Patris, et Fidei, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. All right, I think we'll, we'll begin with the fact that traditionally, in the Latin Mass, in the Roman Rite, the name of St. Michael was invoked seven times. This happened seven times, and it happened, well, it's a little little confusing because it was six times in the Low Mass, seven times in the High Mass, except when Leo the Thirteenth added his Leonine prayers, the St. Michael prayer, that added a seventh time in the Low Mass. We'll look at that in just a minute. Before we do, I want to First, look at why it is that Leo the Thirteenth added Saint Michael to the end of all low masses. Now we know that Pope Pius the Ninth, who was the Pope before Leo the Thirteenth, here's a picture of Leo the Thirteenth right here. All right, got a little bit out of focus, but Leo the Thirteenth. That's a picture of him around 1898. He spoke of a infiltration. All right, that's the book I wrote, Infiltration. He spoke of Yes, he used the words conspiracies, corruptions, and violence. Here's the quote from Leo the Thirteenth: "By way of conspiracies, corruptions, and violence, it has come, it has finally come to dominate Italy and even Rome." And we know from oral traditions that something happened to Leo the Thirteenth that led him to compose two prayers to Saint Michael. The first is the St. Michael prayer, the one we just prayed, St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. And the second one is an exorcism prayer that was to be used by all bishops and pastors in their diocese or in their parishes. So Leo XIII was inspired for some reason to compose these two prayers. And he asked that the St. Michael prayer be appended to the prayers after low mass. Now, if you grew up in the Novus Ordo, if you've never been to a traditional Latin Mass, the Low Mass is a spoken private Mass. It's, I mean, it cannot, it doesn't have to be private, but it's the Misa Privita. It's a, a private Mass, and it doesn't have the chant, it doesn't have the incense, it's just bare bones. Then there's the Solemn High Mass, and this has Gregorian chant and incense, a, a deacon, a subdeacon, all that going on. What the Low Masses? Leo the Thirteenth asked that the prayers that were already put at the end of the Mass, uh, three Hail Marys, Hail Holy Queen by Pius the Ninth, that to be added to that would be the Saint Michael prayer. Now, there's an account from 1931 by a Monsignor Carl Vogel, 
and he relates the legend as to why Leo XIII did this. I'm going to read it to you. A rather peculiar circumstance induced Pope Leo XIII to compose this powerful prayer. After celebrating Mass one day, he was in conference with the cardinals. Suddenly he sank to the floor. Several doctors were summoned, and one found no sign of a pulse. The very life seemed to have ebbed away from the fragile and aging body. Suddenly he recovered again and said, What a horrible vision I have just been shown. He saw the ages to come, the seductive powers and ravings of the devil against the church in every land. But St. Michael appeared in the moment of greatest distress and cast Satan and his cohorts back into the abyss of hell. Such was the occasion that caused Pope Leo XIII to prescribe this prayer for the universal church. End quote. So that's Monsignor Carl Vogel. That was written in 1931. That may or may not be true. I mean, remember, 1931 is a far way off from the 1880s, 1890s. Now, the actual most likely historical tradition is recounted by Leo XIII's personal secretary, and he was named Monsignor Ronaldo Angeli. Monsignor Ronaldo Angeli. And you can get all of this in my book, Infiltration. Monsignor Angeli recounts this story. Those who prowl about the world has a historical explanation which has been shared numerous times by the Holy Father's most faithful secretary who was very close to him throughout his pontificate, Monsignor Ronaldo Angeli. Pope Leo XIII truly had a vision of demonic spirits who were gathering on the eternal city, that is Rome. From that experience which he shared with the prelate and certainly with others of confidentiality, comes to... Pr comes the prayer which he wanted the whole church to recite. This was the prayer which he recited. We heard this many times in the Vatican Basilica with a strong and powerful voice which resonated in an unforgettable way in the universal silence beneath the vaults of the most important temple of Christianity. So here, it's, it's much more bare bones. It's that Pope Leo XIII had a vision of demonic spirits gathering on Rome. So something was going on in this time period before the year 1900 in which Pope Leo XIII saw something and he wrote this prayer because he realized in our battle against the demons, against Satan, not only do we need our Blessed Mother, we need the great archangel St. Michael. We see that in Revelation chapter 12. We see the great woman clothed in the sun and we see Archangel Michael working together to destroy Satan. It's biblical. Apocalypse, chapter 12, check it out. So if that's the case, and St. Michael is so key to our defeat over Satan as Catholics in the Catholic Church, why is it that he has been removed steadily from our liturgical life? Yesterday was Sunday, and it was also September 29th, 2019. And many people were lamenting that on September 29th, which is the great feast day of St. Michael, the mass of St. Michael was suppressed. Now, why did this happen? Well, going back to the Reformation, beginning with Martin Luther, also with Thomas Cramner of the Church of England, also John Calvin of the Reformed uh, Calvinist movement in Switzerland, they asserted that to place saints, saints feast days, on a Sunday took away honor and glory from Christ. That every Sunday is an Easter. Every Sunday belongs to Jesus Christ. And so to allow for a saint to be celebrated and commemorated on a Lord's Day, on a Sunday, took away. Now, the Catholic Church always rejected that theology, that heresy, because we know that all the saints in their sanctity participate in the sanctity of Jesus Christ. Their passions are glorious and meritorious because they are hidden and assumed into the passion of Jesus Christ, culminating on the cross. So when we celebrate, say, St. Michael or St. Therese or St. Peter or St. Maximilian Kolbe, we're not taking anything away from Jesus. Rather, the Virgin Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord. So when we honor Mary or the saints, we magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. There's not a competition. See, a lot of Protestants think 
that if you love Mary 30%, therefore you only love Christ 70%. And if you add in popes and saints and all these things, pretty soon Christ only gets like 3% of your love and your worship. That's bad theology. That's called zero sum theology. I go through it in my book, The The Catholic Perspective on Paul, where I show that in Paul, everything that happens in the church, in the mystical body, participates in Christ. The most common phrase used by St. Paul is en Christo, in Christ. So when we love Mary, we love Christ more. When we love our spouses and our kids, we love Christ more. If I love my children, that doesn't take away from my love of Jesus. That's a very uh, puerile, uh, limited understanding of love, worship, and devotion. Okay, so sadly, in the 1950s, Annabelle Bugnini, who was charged by Pius XII, unfortunately, and I go through why this happened in infiltration, unfortunately, he was charged to reform the Roman Rite. He did this beginning in 1951 by changing Holy Week and Easter. Uh, It continued into 1955 where those changes became permanent. Also changes in the rubrics and changes in the liturgical calendar. By 1960, we're under Pope John the 23rd, Bugnini begins to change the way the liturgical calendar works. And he brings in this false understanding of Luther, Calvin, and Cramner that saints' days should never, ever compete, wrong, wrong term, should never compete with a Sunday because Sundays belong to Jesus. Well, I have news for him. All 365 days in one extra and leap year belong to Jesus Christ. Right, So anytime we have a saint's day, it would technically be taking away from Christ. Again, this is horrible theology. I don't understand how this got pushed through. And so because of that, what we see happening by the time we get to 1969 and 1970, when the Novus Ordo Mass is being promulgated, is that any saint's day are no longer allowed on a Sunday. This is why you'll see that a, a really important Holy Day of Obligation, the Assumption of Mary or the Immaculate Conception, happens on a Sunday, they won't allow it to be celebrated on a Sunday. They'll bump it to Monday. Okay, so this is what's going on. This is this this Protestant understanding of how the liturgical calendar works. That's what's going on. So if you went to the Novus Ordo yesterday, September 29th, which was a Sunday, they did not have the collect, the the secret, any of the propers, the, the the readings, the gospel, the Alleluia, all that was not St. Michael. It was ordinary time. They want ordinary time to be special. St. Michael got, if you went to the Novus Ordo, St. Michael got bumped. Now, if you went to the Latin Mass, St. Michael was in full effect. Everything we did was St. Michael. The readings were St. Michael, the offertory, the secret, the communion, the post-communion prayer. Everything was St. Michael. Now, unfortunately, in the 1962 Missal, which is used by, say, the Fraternity of St. Peter, uh, the Society of St. Pius X, the Institute of Christ the King, even diocesan Latin masses. Even there, by 1960, some of the changes in rubrics uh, had already begun to happen. Now, I'm going to just pull out a couple of these. I have some notes here. What we saw happen in 1960 is that even one of the feasts of St. Michael was done away with. There were originally... Get this, there are originally a number of angel feasts in the Roman Rite. There was the dedication of St. Michael, that was September 29th, that's the one we all know. In the Novus Ordo, that got turned into St. Michael and all the angels, and we'll see in just a minute why. There was also a second feast of St. Michael on May 8th called the Apparition of St. Michael. This referred to the Apparition of St. Michael on Mount Gargano, in which he asked for a temple to be built to worship Christ. That was suppressed and taken away in 1960. So Michael had two feast days in 1960 under John the 23rd, went to one. If you have an older missal, um, I don't have my, here's a a St. Andrew's missal. This is 1945. You will find the old uh, Mount Gargano feast. Let's see here. Yeah, here it is. May 8th, apparition of St. Michael the Archangel. All right, and this is why I recommend to people to get the Father Lassance missile, which I don't have because it's probably in my car or next to my bed. 
to use the Father Lassant's missile, which is 1945, or the St. Andrew's missile, which is also 1945, because it has all the old cool stuff that got cut out by starting around 19, well, starting in 1951, 55, culminating in 1960, 61, 62. So one of the feasts of St. Michael was removed in 1960. That's the apparition feast at Mount Gargano. Now, there were also a, there was also a feast for St. Gabriel, the Archangel. That was March 24th. It was a, a greater double. There's also a feast of St. Raphael from the Book of Tobit. That was October 24th. It was ranked as a double. And of course, there is the Holy Garden Angels Feast. That's October 2nd. It was a greater double back in the old days. So what happened in at Vatican II and subsequently in the liturgical forms, they took away one of Michael's feasts, they took away St. Gabriel, they took away Raphael, and they combined it all into one feast on September 29th. So you have St. Michael and all angels. So they reduced the amount of, of angel saints days really just to one, if you don't count uh, guardian angels on October, uh, October 2nd. That's a bummer. You know, I, I really think the angels are powerful, uh, especially St. Gabriel and St. Raphael. And to, to take away their days, to me, is it's not good. It's not good. We need all the help we need right now. Uh, to collapse them all into one feast day, I think, is a major mistake. And that's one reason why I love going to the traditional Latin mass, because you see the diversity of the angelic feast instead of them all being collapsed into one. Now, in the actual Latin Mass, all right, so when you're attending the Latin Mass, St. Michael pops up pretty often all throughout the Mass. So, uh, like I said at the beginning, uh, during Low Mass, St. Michael is mentioned six times. If you add the Leonine Prayer, it brings it to seven. And in the High Mass, he's mentioned seven times because he's invoked when the priest senses the altar at the offertory. So, Let's look at these instances. So in the traditional Latin mass, it begins with prayers at the foot of the altar. These were, were done away with by Paul VI, regrettably. The priest recites the confidior, I confess to Almighty God. There's a, a trace of this in the Novus Ordo. Originally, the prayer reads like this, and I'll, I'll give you an English one. I confess to Almighty God, to Blessed Mary, ever virgin, to Blessed Michael, the archangel, to blessed John the Baptist, to the holy apostles Peter and Paul, and to all the saints, and to you, either father or brethren, depending if the priest is saying it or the server is saying it, that I have see sinned exceedingly in thought, word, and deed, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, blessed Mary ever virgin, blessed Michael the archangel, blessed John the Baptist, the holy apostles Peter and Paul, and all the saints, and you, Father, to pray for me to the Lord our God. All right. Now, what's pretty cool there is, as you noticed, I was giving you the hand signs. Five saints were traditionally invoked in the Roman Rite. Now, I understand in the Dominican Rite and other uses, this was a little bit varied and different. But in the Roman Rite, the official Rite used at Rome, received in this tradition, there were five saints. The Mother of God, Mary, Michael the Archangel, John the Baptist, Peter, and Paul. And they're ranked in an important order. Mary's the highest. Who comes after Mary? Michael, the archangel. Who comes after Michael, the archangel? John the Baptist, the greatest prophet, the forerunner of our Lord. And then who comes after John the Baptist? Peter and Paul, the two great apostles of Rome, the first pope and the apostle of the Gentiles. And notice that it's invoked twice. Now, by the time you get to the Novus Ordo, the Confidior gets stripped down. And as you know, it goes like this. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters. What happened there? The five saints in the Roman Rite just got zapped. They're gone. So it goes, I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I've great, greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words and what I've done and what I've failed to do through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask Blessed Mary, ever virgin. Ah, Mary came back. She appeared here. All the angels and saints and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. Notice once again that of the five saints that were traditionally invoked here, Mary, praise God, Mary comes back. But the other four, Michael, John the Baptist, Peter and Paul, again, zip, they're gone. So 
This prayer is prayed by the priest and then by the deacons and the, the deacon and subdeacon or the or the servers in a low mass. So that's Michael twice in the priest confidior, twice again in the servers confidior. So we got four Michaels there. Now the next one shows up when the priest and the high mass senses the altar at the offertory. And that prayer sounds like this. Through the intercession of blessed Michael the archangel, standing at the right of the altar of incense, the Lord may deign, deign to bless this incense and receive it in an odor of sweetness. So here, once again, Michael is, it's recalled that Michael is close to the altar of incense in heaven, right? He's overseeing the angelic host. He's overseeing the prayers that are coming into heaven through from us, through the saints, through the angels, through Our Lady, through Jesus Christ, the great mediator. All of that's happening. And, and Michael is the one there kind of guarding the prayers, guarding the incense. And so when the priest gets the incense out and begins to sense the bread and the wine before they're consecrated, he calls upon Michael as sort of a an honor guard, protecting right these these offerings, these oblations that will be brought into the words of consecration and then transubstantiated into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Now, the final reference to Michael occurs in the, some people call it the second confidior or the third confidior. I call it the pre-communion confidior. People are going to receive communion at the Latin mass. The servers or the deacon and subdeacon will pray or chant the confidior again. So once again, they're going to say, I confess to Almighty God. And they're going to mention the Blessed Mother. They're going to mention uh, St. Michael the Archangel. They're going to mention John the Baptist and then the Holy Apostles, Peter and Paul. That's going to happen again two times, once at the beginning, once at the end. So if you add all that up, you have in the High Mass uh, seven invocations of St. Michael. Now in the Low Mass, uh, Leo the Thirteenth asked that the prayers be said. They're called the Leonine prayers after Leo, Leo the Thirteenth. And you're going to have the three Hail Marys, the uh, the Hail Holy Queen, the prayer for the state of the church, and the Saint Michael the Archangel defend us in battle. Usually, those are done in the vernacular. Again, in 1964, Pope Paul the Sixth, at the uh, insistence of Annabel Bunini, removed them. Leonine prayers were taken away. Now, thanks be to God, because of the summer of shame last year and all the controversy in the church and the confusion and the crisis we're seeing, there have been many bishops and pastors who have said, you know what, we are going to return the Leonine prayers. We're going to say three Hail Marys. We're going to say Hail Holy Queen. We're going to say the St. Michael prayer. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. So you're seeing this coming back even in Novus Ordo places. Now, what I'd like to close with here is why would it be, as we enter into one of the most confusing time periods in the history of the Catholic Church, why would it be that we would want to remove and edit out St. Michael from the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass? Is there any good reason? I mean, do we, we save at most maybe eight seconds in our lives at Mass, by removing it. What is the purpose of removing it? In fact, think about if you were interviewing Lucifer himself, the great devil. He would not want us to be invoking St. Michael, asking for his prayers. And remember, in the Confidior, what are we doing? We're confessing our sins. And we're not just confessing them to God. This is very Catholic. Protestants don't like this, guys. We're confessing our sins. Let me read it again for you in the English. I confess to Almighty God, to Blessed Mary Ever Virgin, to Blessed Michael the Archangel, to Blessed John the Baptist, to the Holy Apostles, and Peter and Paul, and to all the saints that I have sinned exceedingly in thought, word, and deed. We're confessing to God, but we're also confessing to Mary, and we're confessing to St. Michael. That's an act of humility, to go before the saints and say, I'm not up there with you guys yet. I'm a sinner right now, and I need your help. I need you to pray for me to the Lord our God. That's the prayer in the Roman rite as we enter in to the mystery of the Mass, as we experience the call to worship 
to come before God in his presence in his holy temple, the first thing that the priest does and then the server and the lay people do is we say, I confess to Almighty God, to Blessed Mary the Virgin, to Blessed Michael the Archangel, to Blessed John the Baptist, to the Holy Apostles, Peter and Paul, and to all the saints, that I have sinned exceedingly in thought, word, and deed. We need to get back to this. This is why when people say, excuse me, I'm not criticizing people who attend the nose, or I'm not saying you're second class. But what I am saying is, when people say that the Latin Mass, or the Novus Ordo is just like the Latin Mass, but in the vernacular, they're wrong. You can see with your own eyes right here, they have removed things. They have removed theology. They have removed saints. They have removed prayers from the heartbeat of the Catholic Church, and that is our liturgy, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. So this is why I always encourage people, find yourself the traditional Latin Mass. Let's go back to the beauty of the Roman Rite. As I always say on Twitter, reclaim the Roman rite. We can see just in yesterday's experience that St. Michael got bumped yet again because ordinary time is somehow more important than St. Michael the Archangel who's going to defend us in, ba in battle. That's just Protestant. It's Protestant. I used to be a Protestant pastor. I used to be an Anglican priest. I know the arguments. That is a Protestant argument. So instead, let's reclaim the Roman rite. Let's invoke St. Michael at the end of all the low masses. Let's invoke Michael in the mass. Let's invoke Michael, let, or the priest invoke Michael when he stands at the altar and senses the bread and wine before they become the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. So thanks again for watching. Uh, we'll close in prayer. Uh, but I just want to say thank you to everyone who's here on the live stream. And uh, thanks for all the prayers and all the encouragement. Uh, we'll be doing a show again tomorrow morning on Tuesday. So stay tuned for that. And please hit the subscribe button and you'll get notified uh, whenever I just randomly decide. I was thinking a lot about it today, about the St. Michael thing. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to turn the camera on and I'm going to talk about, I'm going to riff on St. Michael because enough people are asking about it. Enough people are talking about it. So sometimes I just do these. If you want to get notified when I do these random things, hit the subscribe button and click the bell. The bell's the notification button on YouTube. And uh, please like the video. Please uh, share it on Facebook and on Twitter and let everybody know about it. That's a great way for new people to come. And of course, pray the rosary. Pray the rosary and, what, and do what our family does. At the end of the rosary, we pray the St. Michael prayer. That way we've got the Blessed Mother protecting us under her mantle. And then we have St. Michael pulling out the sword and protecting our family in that way as well. So I encourage everyone, pray the rosary every day. If you're not praying the rosary every single day, you're just not on the team. If you want to be on the team, moving towards a solution, what can we lay people do? Can we offer mass? No. Can we hear confessions? No. Can we go and preach in the pulpit? No, but we can pray the rosary and Our Lady encouraged us to do that in 1917 when she came down at Fatima, also when she gave it to St. Dominic as a weapon and a tool against heresy. There's a lot of heresy out there, a lot of confusion. The weapon is the rosary. So pray the rosary every day. Stay close to Our Lady. Stay close to St. Michael. And if you can, find a traditional Latin Mass and go there and you will hear the beautiful names of Mary and Michael over and over throughout the Holy Sacrifice, which is something you don't necessarily always hear if you attend the Novus Ordo. And again, I am not criticizing or trying to make anyone feel bad who attends the Novus Ordo. I'm just stating a fact. In the Novus Ordo, they removed some of these beautiful prayers and beautiful saints. All right, so I'll sign off here, but first I will close us down in prayer and we'll pray the Hail Mary, the Ave Maria, and we'll pray the Gloria Patri, the Glory Be in Latin. In nomine Patris, et Fidei, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in morieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, or per nobis peccatoribus, nunc editor mortis nostre. Amen. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto, sicut in principio et nunc et semper et in secula seculorum. 
Amen. Saint Michael the Archangel, pray for us. And nomine patris et fide et spiritus sancti. Amen. And before I close, I'll just say, beginning January 1st at New St. Thomas Institute, I'll be doing a history and a study of the Roman Rite, going way back, the traditional Latin Mass, going all the way back to the liturgy in Rome when it was in Greek, how it came into Latin, how it developed, how it was canonized, and how it was received, and then eventually how it was changed beginning in this time period that I mentioned today, 1951, 1955, 1960, and then 1969, 1970. So that'll be a big project, uh, a wonderful curriculum and certificate that we'll be offering at New St. Thomas Institute, and that'll begin January 1, 2020, God willing. So if you're interested in that, check out NewStThomas.com, NewStThomas.com. Until tomorrow's show, God bless you, and pray the rosary. Signing off.